Sailing alone. Just saying it out loud feels a bit mad, doesn't it? No crew, no one to take over the helm, no one to share the night watch or the morning coffee. Just you, the boat, and the sea. And when you're not just day sailing or island hopping, but actually crossing oceans on your own, well, that takes a whole other level of preparation, both mentally and technically. People often ask me, how do you actually do it? Not why, because that's a different conversation altogether, but how? How do you sleep? How do you stay safe? How do you steer, navigate, and fix things when there's no one else aboard? It's a fair question, because solo sailing isn't just sailing minus the crew, it's a completely different kind of seamanship. So in this video, I want to walk you through the technical challenges of solo ocean crossings. Not the romantic side of it, not the sunsets or the dolphins, though they're part of it too, but the gear, the systems, the routines I've come to rely on. This isn't about being fearless, it's about being ready. Let's dive into what it really takes to sail alone, starting with the one thing you can never switch off navigation, and watchkeeping. When you sail alone, keeping a constant watch becomes one of the biggest technical challenges. There's no one else to take a shift, no one to wake you up if something looks off. Every moment, especially in high traffic areas or near land, you have to know where you are, what's around you, and what's coming next. And that means you need help from systems, not people. AIS is the backbone of solo navigation. Mine is always transmitting and receiving. It shows me who's nearby, how fast they're moving, and whether they're on a collision course. I've set mine to sound an alarm if a vessel's predicted to come within one nautical mile in the next 18 minutes. That's my buffer. 18 minutes to wake up, assess, and change course if needed. It's not foolproof, but it saved me more times than I can count. Radar is another essential tool, especially at night or in fog. It's great for seeing squalls and rain fronts, too. I can set exclusion zones on the radar that will trigger alarms if something enters. That said, radar alarms can give false alerts in rough seas, which gets annoying fast. You learn to tune it, set it just sensitive enough to catch threats, but not so twitchy that it cries wolf every five minutes. Navigation software is everywhere these days, on the chart plotter, on my tablet, on my smartphone. I run at least two systems at once, each with different power sources. If one fails, I've got backups. I also keep paper charts as a last resort. I've never had to use them in anger, but they're there. When you're alone, redundancy isn't just smart, it's mandatory. What I've also learned is that lights matter. My navigation lights reach two nautical miles minimum, but I've added additional lights higher up on the mast to stay visible over waves. The downside? Some ships misjudge my distance because those lights look farther away than they are. Still, I'd rather be seen than not. In high traffic zones, I rely on a handheld VHF clipped near the helm and a loud external speaker inside. If a ship gets close, I call them up. This is the sailing vessel on your port bow. Do you see me? Most commercial ships respond, and will make small course corrections once they know you're under sail and alone. Without a crew, you don't just need to see what's happening. You need to be warned in time to act. That means your entire navigation and watch system has to be built around automation, alarms, and ease of access. You're not going to spend the whole night sitting at the helm. And that's why watchkeeping alone is more about preparation than vigilance. If you've set your systems right, they'll keep you informed. If you haven't, well, that's when trouble finds you. Ask any solo sailor what the hardest part is, and most won't say storms or equipment failure, they'll say sleep, or more accurately, the lack of it. Sleep deprivation messes with your judgment, your coordination, your mood. You can sail through a gale if you're rested. You can't even boil water if you're not. Learning how to sleep at sea while still keeping watch is one of the hardest skills to master. The trick is to forget everything you know about normal sleep. Solo sailing sleep is broken up into short chunks with alarms to wake you. A lot of sailors use 20-minute naps based on the time it takes a fast ship to close the distance from over the horizon. Set an alarm, lie down fully clothed, and close your eyes. When the alarm goes off, you scan the horizon, check your instruments, and, if all's well, go back down. I've tried the 20-minute method. It works when you're near shipping lanes or coasts, but it's brutal over the long haul. You can't live like that for weeks. That's why offshore, when I'm well away from land and traffic is light, I switch to 90-minute cycles. That's one full sleep phase, and I wake up feeling functional. I always run AIS and radar alarms, and I make sure I'm far enough from land that I won't drift onto shore even if the wind shifts while I sleep. Of course, there are nights when you just can't risk it. Maybe you're threading between islands or dodging squalls. On those nights, you might stay up all night and catch up later. Other times, you might heave too, essentially putting the boat in a holding pattern just to buy a few hours of rest. It's not ideal, but it's better than making decisions while half awake. One thing I've learned the hard way 
If you push through fatigue, you make mistakes, big ones. You forget to check for chafe on a line. You misjudge a wave. You fall asleep sitting at the helm. That's when gear breaks. Or you do. So I've made peace with slowing down if it means I can sleep. I'd rather lose half a knot than risk my boat. Or my life. Nutrition matters too. If you're not eating right, your sleep suffers. So does your energy, your reaction time, your morale. I prep meals ahead of time, keep snacks handy in the cockpit, and stay hydrated. Coffee helps, but only to a point. There's no caffeine strong enough to replace real rest. In the end, sleep management when sailing alone is a constant balancing act. Risk versus rest. Speed versus safety. You never sleep deeply, and you never sleep for long, but with the right systems and a healthy respect for your own limits, you sleep enough. Just enough. Redundancy is a foundational principle of safe solo sailing. Without a second person on board to assist in emergencies, every essential system must have a backup, and often a backup for the backup. These redundancies aren't about luxury or convenience. They're about ensuring survival in the event of system failure during an ocean crossing. Steering systems are the most critical. A mechanical wind vane offers reliability without drawing power, making it ideal for long passages. However, this should always be supplemented with an electric autopilot, which functions better in light air or when motoring. A third option, such as a spare tiller or emergency steering setup, should also be on board to provide a last resort method of control. Power generation needs multiple sources. Relying solely on solar, wind, or engine alternators can leave the sailor vulnerable if weather, mechanical failure, or a broken regulator takes one offline. Combining solar panels, a wind generator, and a portable fuel generator provides the kind of layered system that can adapt to different failure scenarios. Each charging system should be able to maintain essential functions independently. Navigation tools must also be redundant. A fixed chart plotter should be backed up with electronic charts on a tablet and smartphone, each powered independently. Additionally, paper charts and a traditional magnetic compass provide a failsafe in case of total electronic loss. These should be accessible and protected from moisture. Water supply systems should allow for access even if the main pump or tank fails. Multiple taps, isolated tank segments, manual pumps, and emergency water jugs ensure fresh water availability under all conditions. Communication systems also need layers. A primary VHF radio should be supported by a handheld VHF, satellite messaging device, and ideally an EPIRB for distress signaling. These devices should be kept charged and easily accessible, particularly the handheld and emergency units. The key to redundancy is not just having backups, but ensuring those backups are accessible, tested, and operable under real sailing conditions. Every backup system must be operable by a single person in difficult conditions, wet, tired, and possibly injured. True redundancy is about preparedness, not just equipment. Without it, solo sailing becomes far more dangerous than it needs to be. On a solo passage, the deck is one of the riskiest areas. Tasks that might seem minor with a crew, like adjusting lines or checking sails, become potential hazards when you're alone. A moment's inattention or a single misstep can lead to serious injury or even being lost overboard, making deck safety and emergency preparedness a top priority. Proper deck safety begins with physical barriers and systems that reduce the chance of falling. High, sturdy lifelines and guardrails offer critical protection. These should be mounted securely and run continuously around the deck. Jacklines, preferably rigged along the center line, allow the sailor to remain tethered with the safety harness at all times, even while moving forward. The deck layout should be optimized for solo operation. Sheets, halyards, reefing lines, and furling systems should all lead back to the cockpit. This minimizes the need to go forward, especially in poor conditions. Winches, cleats, and clutches should be within easy reach, and lines should be kept neatly coiled to prevent tripping. Non-skid surfaces are essential for traction, especially when the deck is wet. Footwear with proper grip is equally important. Moving barefoot may offer better feel in calm conditions, but is risky when the boat is pitching or rolling. Emergency preparedness on deck includes having a grab bag ready with essentials such as flares, handheld radio, backup navigation tools, and first aid supplies. This bag should be waterproof and easily accessible. A personal locator beacon, PLB, or EPIRB, should always be worn or nearby, particularly during solo night watches or foul weather. All lines and gear should be regularly checked for chafe and wear. A line that breaks under load can cause a sudden jolt or loss of balance. Likewise, gear stored on deck should be secured to prevent becoming hazardous in rough seas. Preparation also means practicing solo maneuvers, reefing, heaving to, deploying a drogue, and recovering from accidental jibes must be second nature. Emergency drills, such as man-overboard simulations, should be done periodically, even when sailing alone. 
Deck safety and emergency systems are not about comfort. They are about enabling a solo sailor to function effectively and survive in a wide range of conditions. Thoughtful design, regular maintenance, and conservative habits create a safer environment on deck. Maneuvering and docking a sailboat solo requires careful planning, precise control, and an understanding of how the vessel reacts in various conditions. Without a second person to handle lines, fend off, or communicate with dock personnel, every step must be simplified, repeatable, and within reach of one individual. The first priority is preparation. All lines, bow, stern, spring, and fenders should be set and ready before entering a marina or approaching a mooring. Spring lines are especially important for solo sailors as they provide the initial point of control and can be used to stop the boat's motion effectively. Many solo sailors rig a midship spring line to a cleat they can reach from the cockpit, allowing them to secure the boat quickly and stabilize its position before securing the rest. Boat handling must be deliberate and slow. Low speed control is key, especially in tight spaces or with crosswinds. Understanding how the prop walk and rudder affect turning at slow speed is critical. In many cases, a short burst of throttle can help align the boat more accurately than continuous engine use. Solo sailors must also be prepared to abort a docking attempt if conditions become unmanageable. Better to try again than risk damage. Wind and current must always be accounted for. Approaching into the wind or current gives more control, allowing the boat to be stopped or slowed more easily. If approaching with wind or current from a stern, timing becomes more critical, and stopping the boat can be more difficult. A bow thruster, if available, can significantly improve maneuverability, but solo operation should never depend on it alone. The boat should be set up so that all essential controls and engine operation can be managed from one position, ideally the helm. Communication with marina staff or dock hands may not be possible, so visual signals and VHF coordination should be clear and concise. However, the solo sailor should plan to complete the docking unaided. If the engine fails during close quarters maneuvering, a dinghy with an outboard motor may serve as emergency propulsion, though its effectiveness is limited by the size and weight of the main vessel. Anchoring or moving to a safer location under sail may be necessary in such cases. Successful solo docking comes down to preparation, boat control, and risk management. Every movement should be planned in advance, lines pre-rigged, and contingencies considered before making the approach. Sailing alone across oceans isn't just about courage or endurance, it's about systems, precision, and preparation. Every action has to be thought through in advance. Every piece of gear needs to serve more than one purpose. There's no one to cover for mistakes, and no second chance when something critical fails. The technical challenges, navigation, sleep, redundancy, safety, and maneuvering are all manageable, but only if you respect the complexity of doing it solo. It's not a simplified version of sailing with a crew, it's an entirely different discipline, one that demands more attention, more control, and more trust in your boat and your systems. With the right setup and the right mindset, solo ocean crossings are not just possible, they're deeply rewarding. But make no mistake, they're earned through preparation, not luck.